Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Technology Philosophy. Today the topic is free will in Bergson, going through the French philosopher Henry Bergson's claims that free will exists. These claims are mainly related to how time and free will are connected. Henry Bergson wrote in the early 1900s. He was well known in philosophy and intellectual culture more broadly at that time including for anticipating quantum mechanics 30 years ahead of its discovery with his assessment of time as being asymmetrical. In the 1960s, the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze reawakened interest in Bergson per his book Bergsonism, published in 1966, highlighting the importance of Bergson's concepts regarding multiplicity and difference. Now Bergson continues to be relevant as our neuroscience projects are progressing and we wish to better understand subjective experience, free will, and mind-body dualism. Bergson lived 1859 to 1941 and has three masterworks. First, Time and Free Will, an essay on the immediate data of consciousness, published in 1889, arguing that we have free will. Second, Matter and Memory, published in 1896, resolving mind-body dualism with a larger problem frame that takes both body and mind into account as necessary components of a larger phenomenon. And third, Creative Evolution, published in 1907, extending his conception of time as energy in time and free will, such that the energy of time is not just a feature of consciousness, but an ontological principle in itself, a fact of being, where the creative force of time, elan vital, becomes a principle of the external real, philosophical consideration of evolution. Much of the material I'm presenting is a summary of Suzanne Gerlach's book, Thinking in Time, published in 2006 which is about Bergson's first masterwork, Time and Free Will, and his second uh, book, Matter and Memory. To Bergson, what is most important is subjective experience. In the early 1900s, there were tremendous advances in science that everybody was excited about, and some claims and beliefs that perhaps science could demystify all of life. Bergson was firm in claiming that science might indeed have great explanatory power, but only in the physical world of external objects, not in our internal world of mental states and experiences. Bergson's starting point is Kant, who said that we perceive things according to certain ways our mind is structured. Therefore, we can only know things as the mind lets us represent them in thought, phenomena, and not as the things in themselves, noumena. We do not know an objective reality, just a representation of reality. Since only a divine being could have knowledge of noumena, things in themselves, our knowledge is limited to phenomena. In science, we take the world of phenomena as the domain of empirical truth and try to establish knowledge claims about it, looking at the objective measurable part as opposed to the subjective experience part of our minds. In our practice of science, we exclude everything related to the inner world of subjective experience. Bergson says the opposite should also be true, that when we consider inner subjective experience, we should exclude the objective terms of scientific investigation and focus, our concepts related to inner, focus on concepts related to inner experience, intensities, multiplicity, and duration. Intensities refers to our experience of qualities, feelings, and sensations. Multiplicity is the idea that mental states are not really discrete and separable, but rather overlap, merge, and add together dynamically, and also that the same feeling can never be felt twice, at minimum because the very fact of having felt something before changes the nature of the experience the second time, and this influences not just isolated events but the whole ensemble of history. Duration is the notion of the inner experience of time, how time is not experienced like clock time. It feels different when you are waiting for water to boil or having a good time. Living in time is important to Bergson. 
that we experience reality as an ongoing melding of states and don't think of time as little spatial blocks on our calendar. Duration is central to Bergson's argument for free will, and he makes two moves to make, to make this claim. First, time is a force. Bergson's first move is to claim that time is a force. Time is a force for two reasons. First, things are not the same over time, and second, things accumulate over time. Pain, for example, can last and change over time, sometimes becoming unbearable. The experience of pain accumulates over time through memory. Whereas past time constitutes neither a gain nor a loss for a supposed system of conservation, it is a gain in the sense of an accumulation for a conscious being. To the extent that time acts as a gain, it acts as a cause and is a force. So for Bergson, time is a force like the other forces of nature, but critical to the free will argument is that time as a force does not obey the laws of nature. The laws of nature only pertain to the physical world, but not to time as an internal force because time is irreversible and accumulates. Second, connecting time as a force to free will. Bergson's second move is to connect time as a force to free will. He claims that it is the force of time that makes free will possible. Free will is the force of lived time. There is a conscious force or free will which, subject to the action of time and storing up of duration, would escape the law of the conservation of energy. Therefore, mechanistic explanations like the laws of nature focus only on the external physical world and omit the essence of what free will means, the possibility of voluntary action as opposed to automatic reaction. How the exercise of voluntary action or free will actually happens is that we experience freedom when we are living in time, in the inner experience duration sense of time. We are in tune with our inner experience of intensities, qualities, feelings, and sensations. We act freely when we listen to our own experience and act passion passionately and decisively. We sense that we cannot explain these moments or what caused them. We have a sense that experiences are unique and will never happen again in quite the same way. Bergson concludes that free will has little to do with intelligence and everything to do with memory and sensation. And further, it is not that we are not free, it is that we do not want to be free. Bergson extends his formulation of time as a force to time as energy. Time is a new type of energy to which the conservation of energy laws do not apply. With memory, time becomes energy by passing, by losing itself in the very act of becoming, and by being stored through memory. It acts as a force in conscious beings because it accumulates in them. Our living body and memory hold the energy of time. Time is always flowing and consciousness is always working through this flow. We can only know lived experience and flowing time concretely through the way different qualities feel to us at different times. We cannot know it cognitively through abstract ideas. Further, language is inadequate in conveying the qualities of our internal experience. Flawed free will formulation as a choice between two alternatives. Bergson then turns to explaining how we have gotten off track in looking at the problem of free will. The usual formulation of the free will determinism debate, particularly in the approach of associationists and mechanistic psychologists, is flawed. Free will is framed as a choice to decide between two alternatives, which is a problem for two reasons. First, per Bergson's concern about our over-spatializing our comprehension of reality, it already incorrectly translates time onto space by placing the decision spatially. And second, per Bergson's ongoing critique of language and preference for the concrete over the abstract in subjective experience, it focuses on the symbolic representation of the event, not the events happening itself. 
the act performed instead of the act of performing. In plainer terms, the formulation that we are free to choose between two alternatives is flawed because most of the time a, cho a choice is only identifiable and rationalized afterwards. In reality, action unfolds in a time of becoming where there are no clear alternatives in advance and there is a self that lives and develops through the effect of hesitations until the free action separates from the self like a ripe fruit which falls from a tree. Bergson thereby concludes and locates freedom in hesitation, not in choice, and again connects freedom with our concrete engagement with the flow of time as the relation of the concrete self to the act it performs. In summary, today we looked at Bergson's first masterwork, Time and Free Will, especially as explicated by Suzanne Gerlach in Thinking in Time. According to Bergson, we cannot treat the inner world of consciousness and subjective experience on the model of the physical world. We need to purify concepts from their objective scientific use for the purpose of examining subjective experience, where the important features are the intensity of qualities, the multiplicity of overlapping mental states, and duration, the lived experience of time. Time is a force because it has a causal role in experiences not being the same each time or over time and in allowing experiences to accumulate through memory. Time is therefore a force, but an internal force not subject to the laws of nature as external forces. Exactly because time is not governed by mechanistic external forces, it allows room for the exercise of free will. The force of time makes free will possible and we exercise it when we are living in time, tuned into our subjective experience and acting passionately and decisively according to our own experience. A more accurate conceptualization of our freedom is not in deciding between two alternatives, but rather in experiencing free actions carving themselves out of our hesitations as we plunder through the constant becoming of life. Thank you, and please join me next time for another episode of Technology Philosophy.